Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. So we're really excited for today's episode. Over the course of many months, many listeners have written in and asked us if we could do an episode on climate change. And we knew we could not do the topic justice without our colleague, Jeff Keel. Jeff is a climate scientist. He has a PhD in atmospheric science. He is also a Jungian analyst. He trained with us at the Interregional Society for Jungian Analysts, and he works primarily as an analyst these days. And Jeff is interested in what depth psychology can tell us about how we got here and also what we might do about it. And both of these topics and many others he addressed in his recent book, It's called Facing Climate Change, An Integrated Path to the Future, and we will put a link to it in our show notes. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Lisa, for the invitation to be a participant in your conversations. I know all of you through the interregional and have a deep respect for the work you're doing. I'm looking forward to this conversation. So how did we get here? Perhaps before we talk about how did we get here, where where is here? Well, most people who are listening to this podcast are probably aware of the uh, events that are occurring around the environment and have been taking place for the last few decades. Uh, We hear that we're global warming. It's the sort of the meme or the the phrase that is used most to uh, talk about climate change. And essentially, we've been observing the planet warming over the last 40 or 50 years. And the question arose within the scientific community, why is the planet warming? Uh, And through lots of good science, uh, which began actually in the 19th century, we know the answer to that question. Uh, The planet's warming through the actions of uh, human beings, through the use and burning of fossil fuels. We increase the strength of the greenhouse effect of the planet, which keeps the planet warm. And the more you strengthen that greenhouse effect, the planet gets warmer and warmer. And Jeff, so this is not an opinion, right? This is, there's scientific consensus on this. That's right. It's not an opinion. Was it Senator Moynihan had the phrase, everyone's entitled to their opinions, but not their facts, not the facts. Exactly. And, and science is providing us factual information. That is, we use the laws of physics to try to answer the question, what's causing the planet to warm? And when you use the laws of physics, you come up with one single answer, which is uh, if we burn fossil fuels, we put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That in turn strengthens the greenhouse effect, which in turn warms the planet. That's uh, unequivocal. It's uh, been shown over and over by independent scientists around the world year after year. What percentage of of scientists that are engaged with this issue would would you say would agree with that interpretation? 97% or more. uh, It's it's a poll taken every year within the science community. So there's 3% that don't agree with that consensus. And, and some of those get, get big platforms and newspapers. Right. And well, this is an interesting, uh, another factoid, which is uh, there's a poll that's taken to assess the public's perception on the consensus within the scientific community. And so the public is asked, you know, is there a scientific consensus on uh, global warming within the scientific community? The public, and this is a statistic that's been steady for decades, 50% of the American public answer, uh, no, there is no consensus within the scientific community around climate change or global warming. 
But the reality is 97% of the scientific community states unequivocally that, you know, we are warming the planet. How do you explain this discrepancy between 50% of the American public think there is, believe there is a, a huge debate going on in the scientific community when in reality there isn't? Well, I think it does come back to what you said, Lisa, that you know, when articles are written in the news, it's often presented as scientist A says humans are causing climate change, and then they'll find one of the 3% that'll say, no, humans aren't the cause of climate change. So if someone who reads an article like that, what are they going to conclude? Well, there's a huge disparity between the scientific assessment of this. Jeff, I am curious, though, um, as a human being, you know, as a psychoanalyst and as a scientist, and you read that statistic where 50% of the people don't believe the truth, what 97% of the scientists know to be true, what does that do inside of you as a human being? What does that set up in you? Frustration, a <laughs> sense of uh, frustration that... Uh, well, and, and the bigger issue is the scientific community is telling the world we need to act on this issue or, you know, things are going to get a lot worse with regards to the degradation of our environment. I mean, there is some action, but not a lot of action. Not, not enough, too, too little, too slow uh, occurring. And this is a message that the scientific community has been giving the world for decades now, and they're still too little action, and it's happening too slowly. That's even more frustrating uh, to the scientific community. And it brings up, I see more and more scientists getting angry. You know, they're, they're becoming more vocal. They're becoming activists. Uh, they're going out and marching in the street because they've learned that by publishing articles in peer-reviewed journals just isn't getting the message out. That needs to get out to the, the people. Uh, and so I support that, you know, that that's how the, the emotions around this uh, within the scientific uh, community, it's expressing itself now more vocally, uh, more adamantly, uh, not just to the politicians, but to the public, you know, directly to the public. It, it says so powerfully to me how incredibly difficult it is in the first place just to accept that this is really happening. Because if we accept that global warming is a reality and then we are called to action, uh, it will change the changes we're being asked to face, the problems we're being asked to solve are enormous. And I can see that a giant wall of denial uh, comes up that there are 3% of scientists who don't think there's a problem. I'm going with them. There's a great Doonesbury cartoon of a, where a guy is sitting in a doctor's office and he's going off on this climate change hoax stuff and the doctor turns to him and says, you know, you've got a serious diagnosis here uh, and it's life-threatening. Uh, but, but if you change uh, certain things, you're, you'll, you're going to be able, we'll be able to deal with this and the guy looks at the doctor and says, so if I went to 100 doctors and asked them, how many of them do you think would give me the same diagnosis? He said, 97. And the guy says, so there's three doctors out there that would basically say, I don't have a problem. <laughs> and the doctor says, yes. He says, gee, you think I could go see one of them? You know, that's, yeah. that's yeah. the attitude yeah. of, uh, you yeah. know, we just don't want to face this issue because it's us. You know, if it's human cause, it's you, we are humans. We are causing the problem. And that's, that's an enormous thing to, to, to take on. It's also so overwhelming and terrifying. And I think that there is a sense of helplessness that comes up. Mm -hmm. I know that's what happens for me. I just feel relatively helpless to do anything. Well, when I give talks to the public on this, uh, I do ask, uh, my typical way of speaking to the public is to, to tell them the science in about 20 minutes so you can summarize the, what's happening to the planet and why and where we're going to go in the future if we don't do something soon. 
And then I'll just stop and ask, you know, I really am interested. How are you feeling? I've given you the, the facts around climate change. How do you feel? And usually there's dead silence in the room, but there's always a brave soul that raises their hand and says, often the first thing that they'll say is, I feel completely helpless. The enormity mm-hmm. of this problem. Or then someone will say, hopeless. I have, you know, I've lost hope around this. Anger is another feeling. I'm angry at the, the fossil fuel industry, or I'm angry at the government for not taking this on. Guilt, often this is a feeling that's expressed by older people in the audience. How much I've contributed and my generation's contributed to this, so I'm feeling guilty. Uh, Sometimes people dissociate. Uh, I have had people say, you know, right in the midst of what you were talking about, I spaced out. I can't even tell you. I can't remember what you said. I just spaced out. Well, they dissociate. Or there's some people's immediate gut reaction is, I cannot believe this is happening. I just cannot believe this. So there's the denial. So we know from psychodynamics, these are all defense, you know, these are defenses that we have uh, unconscious that come to deal with the anxiety, the, the fear, uh, the strong affect that arises up within our psyches. They're all, these are things that are t- normal responses. And this is a message that I really would like to convey to people. If you are feeling any of the people who are listening to this podcast, if you're feeling any or all of these, you're normal. Thank God you're feeling Mm -hmm. these things. If you didn't feel this way, I'd be really concerned because this is how this is a part of our 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 beingness that when presented with an existential threat like climate change is, we have these reactions. We do feel helpless. We do feel hopeless. We feel anger. We can dissociate. We can deny. And so the first step in working with this psychologically is to actually sit with those feelings, those emotions. Don't turn them off. Don't deny them. Sit with them. So, Jeff, it sounds like what you're saying is part of how we got here is our defenses have been working really well. And isn't that really parallel to what happens in us as individuals, that up to a certain point, our defenses work really well, and then something happens uh, in our lives that just penetrates and kind of sometimes crashes through those defenses. And I'm thinking that recently, you know, so many awful weather events around the world, the fires in Australia, fires in California, tornadoes, floods, hurricanes are starting to crash through our collective defenses. We cannot ignore this anymore. And it raises our anxiety that we're starting, I'm hoping at least, that we're starting to have to face this terrible shadow. Very good observation. You know, this this issue has often been uh, noted that it's distant in time and distant in space. Some of the largest changes that have been occurring are in the Arctic. Well, not many of us live in the Arctic. The demise of Arctic sea ice is 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 uh, quite dramatic uh, over the last two or three decades, and the implications it has for life up there is quite you know it's threatening the existence of the polar bear. But those, those are, you know, thousands of miles away, those phenomena. And so distance in space. And then the largest changes are, are yet to come if we continue to rely on fossil fuels. So distant in time. And so from a felt sense perspective, uh, that's another reason why we've been, I think, we're uh, reticent or avoidant uh, of action because we really aren't experiencing these phenomena close in space and close in time. However, that's changing. I live in California. The fires are very close. Uh, the devastation from those events are, you know, they're palpable. They're here. And maybe that's one of the ways we could work with this is changing the definition of climate. Climate can feel like an abstract word. 
that uh, we can't relate to. But if we start looking at pictures of uh, the fires and the floods in California, the, the fires in Australia, the pictures of those fires, uh, which are horrendous. I mean, I, when I see pic- those pictures, I think of in Dante's Inferno. It's, it's becoming a reality. The, the fact that over one billion, one billion animals have been destroyed, killed in those fires over a matter of weeks, that was, that's staggering. I mean, uh, that's climate. Those images, the feelings that arise around those images, you can think of that as climate. I think that's so essential, and I think the media is playing such an important role, actually, in that. Because if we think of climate as a kind of archetype, which is relatively invisible, we need images to clothe the archetype and to mediate between something that seems incredibly abstract and maybe spiritual and our individual psychological experiences. So if climate change or my mobilization around climate change um, is how do I stop the wildfires or how do I respond to hurricanes or tsunamis, that to me seems much more graspable and probably more actionable. It also evokes such, I'm sitting here now, such intense feeling of those fires in Australia and the loss of well over a billion animals. You know, if it were people, the whole world would be in an uproar about it. But the sadness and the feeling is truly hard to bear. Well, and it speaks to our disconnection from the natural world and from the instincts, which is something that Jung talked a lot about. Yeah, so now we're moving, you know, we were talking about where is here, and here is are the fires in Australia. Here are the floods, the storms. That's where we are. And what science tells us is that if we continue to put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, if we continue to rely on fossil fuels, those phenomena are only going to intensify and increase in frequency. Okay, so things are going to get worse, basically. So that's, that's here, and that's where we're going. But then the more uh, fundamental question is, how did this all take, how did we get here? And I think that's, Lisa, your point, which is, it really has to do with how related we are, how connected we are with the, the non-human world, the natural world. And Jung, was, he wrote a lot about that. He was very, very concerned about what he called our one-sided nature. In his writings, he says, you know, it's an inevitable consequence of the development of consciousness that we separate from nature. We separate from our instinctual part of ourselves. So we need to address that separation. One way that Jung talked about it is we need to know the animal. We need to know our animal. We need to stay connected to animals. I believe this, the, the feelings that we have when we read about the losses that are occurring in Australia, that's an archetypal reaction. Okay, you know, Jung talks about archetypes as being the images of instinct, right? There's a connection between archetype and instinct. And so when we read about the horrific loss of life in Australia or the fact that we're, our species is driving a huge number of other species into extinction, that's going to connect us to that, our, our own instinctual animal. We're kindred animals. Uh, we can't separate ourselves. We've tried. Our conscious development has led to that separation. But it is so important for us to reconnect to the, our instinct and our animal especially now. Of course, there's the collective way we need to do that. But Jung was also very interested in how that was necessary at an individual level. And he has a quote, most of our difficulties come from losing contact with our instincts, with the age old forgotten wisdom stored up in us. And he saw that people coming into the consulting room often needed to find 
a way to tap into that level of themselves and that that could be medicinal. Right. Well, you know, often that pathway is through the dream and the animals start showing up in a person's dreams. Sometimes those are wounded animals that show up in, in the dream. And then the question is, how does the animal heal the wound? Uh, what's the wound telling the client? You know, where is the wound in, in, the, in the animal? What animal has shown up? Those are, those are extremely rich ways to reconnect with instinct on an individual level. And that the dream animal is us and that the creatures are us is the feeling that we're hoping to generate and out of that felt kinship that there is very little distance, if any, between us and the suffering creature that we might mobilize or something might mobilize in us, which goes to a question that I often sit with, which is, can human beings be motivated exclusively by wisdom or do human beings have to be motivated by suffering? And it seems to me a very small percentage of people can be motivated by wisdom and it seems that suffering has to reach a kind of pitch before human beings, particularly in mass, will take a kind of communal shift in orientation, which seems so tragic to me in general. But it does seem to be the way it works. You know, I'm r reminded right now of something extraordinary that uh, I read a few weeks ago that I, I shared on the podcast that we did about the Australian fires it seems that toward the end of Jung's life, he had a disturbing vision, and it was uh, where he saw enormous stretches of the planet devastated. And in an interview, von Franz said that she would pray every day that humankind would wake up from its shadow foolishness and pre prevent the final catastrophe. So, Joseph, it seems like that's right in line with what you were saying, that, that can we be motivated by, by wisdom? You know, because the alternative is we wait until it's too late. And we see that in the consulting room all the time, that a client comes in, you know, and I often use this metaphor with clients and I'll say, you know, you can learn about life through wisdom or you can learn about life by running your face into it like a brick wall. And what's your method? What's your method of encountering life? Well, we can, I think we can look at this also in terms of climate change. Jung, you know, in his time, he was worried about two collective issues. One was nuclear war and the other one's overpopulation. And someone asked him once, you know, how do we deal with overpopulation? And his answer was pretty direct. He said, you know, if we don't, Earth will find a solution. Earth will tolerate so much, and then she'll find a solution. I'm wondering if climate change, you know, through our ignorance, through our denial, we are disrupting Earth and all life on Earth. How long will Earth tolerate until a reaction occurs? This is how psyche works, right? If you consciously deny something, if you consciously become too one-sided, a reaction takes place, and that reaction arises out of the collective unconscious. Could we imagine, could we play with and imagine what's happening now with the disruptions that we see daily now in Australia, California, wherever, India, Africa, are these the messages arising from Earth to warn us that we have to change, we have to shift our consciousness, that we have to invite the unconscious into the conversation, into the way that we're looking at the world that we live in? If, if there's anything that we have collectively done over the last few hundred years, it's to relegate the unconscious to uh, a non-existence. I think perhaps it's going to tolerate that for so long, and then it's going to say, you can no longer ignore me. Jeff, I'm wondering, this is a, the various kinds of interpretive lenses that we could use, that if we think of the Earth as a living being, this was very popular in the idea of the Gaia theory, 
But of course, this is much more ancient. You know, the earth was thought of as a titan, as a person, as Rhea, and, and all kinds of other names. A turtle. A turtle, yes. So when a catastrophic event happens, in one way, we could think of it as a warning. Could we also think of it in the way that a dream comes as a compensation? Is it possible that the events that happen globally, whether it's hurricanes, wildfires, tsunamis, that that is actually part of the system's attempt to compensate for imbalances, even though it may be a harsh medicine? Yes. Uh, you know, why is the planet warming? Uh, I, I went through a little of the science. It's, you know, we're, we're upsetting the greenhouse effect. We're in, enhancing the greenhouse effect. Well, what does that mean? Well, from a scientific perspective, what it really means is we are affecting the energetic flow within the Earth system. That the amount of sunlight coming in is no longer balanced by the amount of heat leaving the planet. We've generated an energetic imbalance to the climate system. Now, think about that image. Now, what's the imbalance within us? We've just been talking about it. We have a psychic imbalance within us if we deny the existence of our instincts, if we disconnect from the unconscious. That creates a huge imbalance. So there's a mirroring here that's occurring, a mirroring between inner and outer. As above, so below. Indeed, as above, so below. The, the inner imbalance within us is manifesting in the outer world as an imbalance in the flow of energy. So the consequence of that, what's the symptom? The symptom is climate change, global warming. But the, what's the cause? From a psychological perspective, it's our own inner imbalance, our personal imbalance, and our collective imbalance. Wow. So I think, you know, what we're seeing in the symptom is indeed telling us you're out of balance. You are out of balance. You know, this, this is like the, the rainmaker story, right? Which, which maybe we should tell that story because our listeners may not know it, Jeff. Well, Jung, uh, you know, uh, I think it was Barbara Hannos told the story that Jung told the people around him that wherever they were, if they had the chance, they should tell the rainmaker story. <laughs> he felt it was so essential that uh, we spread that story. And the story, he got it from Richard Wilhelm, who was the guy who brought the I Ching to the West. Wilhelm heard that there was a, a place in China that had been suffering from drought. And uh, the people in that local region had done everything possible to bring the rains to, to that community, to that land. Nothing worked. So they eventually sent for the rainmaker from a different part of China. And this wizened old man shows up and looks around and asks to be uh, placed in a hut just outside the town. And within a few days of him being there, a huge snowstorm arose, and it was very freakish storm you know, that it would be snowing, and it was it brought a lot of water to the uh, community, so it addressed the, the the problem. And so Wilhelm went out into the hut and asked this rainmaker, "How did you do this? What did you do?" And his response was, "I didn't do anything." And, and Wilhelm said, but, you know, you show up, and a few days later, he, we, there's water here. How do you explain that? And he said, all I did was I came to this community and saw that it was in, out of balance. It being out of balance put me out of balance. And so I needed to go somewhere and quietly put myself back into balance. And the result of that was, you know, things came back into balance. Mm -hmm. So that's the rainmaker story. The, you know, the message is that, again, inner and outer, as above, so below, and that we have to be very uh, aware of how, to what extent are we out of balance within our own psyches, within the collective, because those imbalances don't stay confined 
within the individual or the, the community, they can propagate out to the environment. Uh, local pollution issues are a statement of imbalance, uh, not just climate change. It's, you know, if you're polluted, your rivers are polluted, your lakes are polluted. That's an indication that your community is out of balance, psychically out of balance. You know, this is actually, there's such an undercurrent of, of hope here in uh, the Rainmaker story and uh, what you're saying, that we as individuals, you know, if we can put ourselves in balance, uh, it will make a huge difference. And people are always asking, well, what can I do? I, I can't change national policy or perhaps even, you know, a local situation. I'm just one person. But we can put ourselves in balance, the as above, so below. And I'm thinking about it's right in the front of your book, which we've not yet mentioned to our listeners, and it's called Facing Climate Change, An Integrated Path to the Future. And right in the frontispiece of your book, uh, Jung says, any change must begin somewhere. It is the single individual who will experience it and carry it through. The change must indeed begin with an individual. It might be any one of us. Nobody can afford to look round and wait for somebody else to do what he's loath to do himself. But since nobody seems to know what to do, it might be worthwhile for each of us to ask himself whether by any chance his or her unconscious may know something that will help us. Uh, it seems really profound and truly radical that the unconscious could really be that effective in each one of us as individuals and that it would have a ripple effect. I think that's what Jungian psychology mm. brings to the world, the recognition of that avenue, that wisdom, that source of knowledge. I'd love to, to come into the other side of it, of, of Deb's very optimistic and healing attitude. <laughs> Let's not get too optimistic. Yeah. Well, but I know you've also done research, Deb, which is there are certain attitudes that help people come into sync with the environment, come into sync with their own unconscious, with their bodies. But you've also done research on the kinds of attitudes that impede that relationship to the collective, that relationship to one's unconscious and to the environment. So I'm wondering if you can speak to some of the ideas or attitudes that people cling to that seem to block this relationship. For instance, I remember in one of your lectures, you said there's a kind of myth that the earth is somehow endlessly adaptive, that no matter what we do to the earth, that's an attitude. That's right. We always have a myth whether we want to use that word or not. It's a narrative that guides our, our collective behavior. And there are lots of myths out there that we uh, say we believe in or follow. But I think uh, the dominant myth in the world today is the myth of infinite growth, that we can uh, increase our wealth, our material val uh, possessions, endlessly. Most politicians that I know, whether they're liberal or conservative, they're all for growth. Could you imagine a politician making a plat one of the planks on their platform, no growth? We've, we have enough, let's stop growing. Uh, I don't think that would sell very well to <laughs> independent of country. All countries believe in this, that we must grow. You know, our, our GDP or whatever metric you use for wealth, it must increase from year to year. Now, there's a huge problem with that myth. It, it's rooted in the belief that the earth is going to provide us with endless resources to grow. And we live on a finite planet with finite resources. We've already extended ourselves beyond the, the resources that are available, and we're only continuing that extension. What does that mean? Well, we're using more than we, we should, and, and, it's, and it's there to 
to use. And we're foisting that deficit onto the future generations. They're the ones that are going to pay for this infinite growth myth that we've all invested so much in. And to challenge that belief, it, 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 it's quite threatening. You mean I need to give up something? I need to give up oh, the, the thing that I wanted to buy? And then there's a social justice issue here. There are certain countries in the West that have been the ones that have consumed the most over the last century, that have contributed the most to this problem. And then there's the rest of the world that wants the same lifestyle that, that the West has. Do we have the right to deny them that lifestyle? Basically say, well, we've taken all the resources and given ourselves this wonderful lifestyle. There's nothing left for you. You can't reach the same lifestyle that uh, we, are, we have. I, I don't think we can do that to the rest of the world. So there's a social justice issue of how do we get out of this belief in infinite growth, allow other countries in the world to reach a standard of living that you know, we've benefited from, from for many years, uh, and avoid uh, collapse. Uh, that's the fear, that if we were to stop, get off this treadmill, get off this perpetual growth myth, that the whole system would collapse, that we've invested uh, some sort of, a, the belief has become a god. Young's statement, uh, hunger makes food a god. Mm -hmm. So it becomes archetypal. You know, I think there's a corollary myth to the one that you've just articulated, which is scientists will save us. Science will yes. save us. We'll, we'll come up with some way to make fuel out of out of air or out of stardust or, or some such thing. Well, yeah, technology will, you know, that's, it's, it's, I don't think it's so much the scientific community. Uh, people are putting their trust in technology. Somebody will figure out uh, technology. Now, I think that uh, we need those tech, we need renewable energy technologies. We, we're not going to stop using energy. 87%, <laughs> I think, of of our energy comes from the burning of fossil fuels. If we got completely stopped using fossil fuels, well, where are we going to get that energy? You know, to we're, we're using computers here to carry on this conversation. So technology is developing, trem making tremendous strides in finding other ways of generating energy that don't depend on the burning of fossil fuels. And we, that is the technological future. But there's a catch here. We cannot, if, we, if that's all we do, put all of our hope on technology, it's not going to get us out of the infinite growth myth. We need to get off of that myth. So that brings me, Jeff, to another important question. I mean, we started off talking about how people feel helpless in the face of this. Let's, for our listeners, answer the question, what can we do as individuals? How, what steps can we take? And also, how can we orient to this so that we don't need to dissociate or collapse into hopelessness? What, what can you tell our listeners? Well, I, I want to approach this first from the inner interior world. I do believe we have to look at our, our psyches uh, how out of balance we are psychologically within ourselves and within the, the world that we live. So asking the questions of where am I being one-sided? What are the myths that I'm invested in personally and collectively? What is the work that I need to do to understand what the unconscious is saying to me about how I'm living in this world? So listening to dreams, where, who, are there animals coming to me? What are they saying to me? This is the inner work. You know, this is the process that we all have, are tasked with carrying out. We cannot just expect the outer world to, uh, to address these issues before we uh, do some of our own inner work to, to, 
come closer to balance. This is the rainmaker. You know, the rainmaker didn't go into the community and say, okay, community, let's build this, you know, cannon that will shoot things in the sky and create rain. No, the rainmaker said, build me a hut so I can go and sit in there by myself. That's an essential part of the answer to your question, Lisa. So our own psychological work, uh, we need to continue to do that. Uh, we need to ask, how related am I to the natural world? How often do I connect to the natural world? So it's so easy for us to go through a day where we're never even in the presence of the natural world. There's an interesting study that's been going on for decades. Like 50 or 60 years ago, the average American spent around six hours a day in direct contact with nature. Hmm. The last time that study was done a decade ago, it was like 12 minutes. Oh, you know, 12 minutes of being in direct contact with some form of nature. So that's, there's an imbalance we could all work on. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you have to go out on a wilderness hike. It means taking a little time every day to being with some component of the up more than human world. That's a conscious choice that we can make. It's hard to do. Uh, we lived in New York City for almost 20 years. Central Park is a beautiful place to go and yes. walk through. It is, know? but a lot of the time, uh, a person's day, the time outdoors in, quote, nature is walking from the apartment building to the subway. And, that, and that's nature. Could be a plant that you put, grow in your apartment. It could be the... The, your pet, your, your dog or your cat. I mean, these are all ways of connecting to the other than human world. Yeah. And dreams are that too, aren't they? And dreams also, yes, tending to your dreams. So those are th that, that's where I would start. You know, that's the first thing that I would uh, recommend for people to do is tend to their psyches uh, and look at how, how they're interacting uh, with the world around them uh, in a felt way. There are four s basic ways we relate to the world. It's how do we perceive time? You know, how are we living time with time? Is it something that's always racing through us? Is there a way we can slow it down? Uh, space, how am I in my spatial environment? The, how do I tend to the place that I live in, the room that I, that I live in? How do I bring balance to the house that I live in, the apartment I live in, the workplace? Uh, body. What's my relationship to my own body? How do I care for it? How do I tend to it? Those are fundamental ways that we uh, are being in this world is established. And so just being aware of, of how we perceive time, how we work with time, how we work with space, how we work with body. All of those define our relationship with the world that we're in. So those are things that you know, we can do at any time, any moment, seize the moment. And the fourth one, it seems to me, is our internal or interior psychic world, the world of the unconscious, our dreams. It's how we relate to the, the, that inner world, indeed. How we tend to it uh, is an important dimension to our being here in any given time. In terms of the outer world, how do we uh, lower our impact on the environment? You can do a personal assessment of your carbon footprint. There are tools out on the internet that will tell you how big your carbon footprint is. You know, the things that I usually talk with people about are. Um, Travel is a big one. Can you cut back on the travel that you're committed to? And I'm guilty of this personally. I, you know, the things that I do, the places I go require a lot of travel. How often do you travel? When you do travel, do you take an option to offset the carbon emissions that that travel is bringing with it? The other thing is, how do you eat? We know that meat is a fairly carbon-intensive food source, decreasing the amount of meat that you eat every week or 
don't eat meat at all. Uh, that's another personal choice that you can make. A bigger one is where are your investments? If you have personal investments, how many are those investments supporting the fossil fuel industry? Uh, they're not good investments, we know, from uh, the performance of the fossil fuel stocks. So it'd be actually very advisable for you to get out of supporting those uh, industries. The other one is what I call the personal messenger, that learn enough about this issue. Often, you know, people say, you know, climate change, global warming, it's a complex issue. It's scientifically difficult to understand. Well, you know, I actually don't believe that it's that complex uh, to explain. There, I, in my book, I give the five facts on climate change. Uh, they're the five scientific facts that we know about climate change, which uh, show uh, clearly that we are the source of, you know, uh, the warming of the planet. So learn those five facts and become a messenger. Even if you don't learn the five facts, bring up the conversation with your family, with your friends, with strangers. When an opportunity presents itself, invite the conversation around uh, our impact on the global environment and see how people react. They may not want to go there, but at least you've tried to open the door around uh, conversing with people around the issue. The final one I would say is vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Participate. Participate in the process uh, and try to get people elected. And I'm not talking just at the federal level, you know, at your local town, city level. Look at the people that are running and what they have to say, if they have anything to say about this issue. And vote for those people who have plans, who support bigger plans to get us off of fossil fuels. So you start from the ground up, work your way the whole way from local community up to the federal level to put people in office who are committed to actually acting on the problem. So those are things that I talk to people about and say that you as an individual can do this. Ultimately, we are going to need a government intervention on this problem. There will have to be legislation passed at the city levels, state levels, and federal levels to address the bulk of this problem. But it does come back to us as individuals and what we can do in the inner world, in our own living space, interior, in our interior world, in the outer world, and then our actions and how they spread out to the greater collective. The unconscious can be the uh, progenitor of surprising new directions or changes in orientation, both on an individual and collective level. So there's a sense of wanting to make space for that to come through. And on that note, this Jungian Life is uh, hereby requesting your dreams that you feel might have something to do with the climate and uh, we'll have a new dream form just for that. And uh, I'll be putting it up on the website shortly so that if you have a dream that you think relates to the crisis in uh, the climate and global warming, share it with us and let's just have a repository of these and, and see what wants to come from that. It's another way in which we can be connected. And I think what we've taken from this with you, Jeff, is that everything is connected. Indeed. In, in complicated ways, in ways we don't always see. But that seems to be, maybe uh, it could even be the start of a new mythology that we are all connected. And we're connected with our dreams, with this earth, with our local officials in government, and and so on and on. Well, it's it's not a new myth, you know. <laughs> of course, you know many oh. indigenous peoples. <laughs> yeah. That's been their myth from the beginning, uh, and it was our myth, uh, a Western myth. Uh, if you go back far enough in time to our indigenous roots, uh, those beliefs of reciprocity and interconnectedness to uh, the world uh, around us were central to the way we 
lived and, and viewed the world. And we lost that along the way. And I think one of the things that we're called to do is, is to reconnect uh, to those original myths in, in new ways. Hi, this is Deb from this Jungian Life podcast. Joseph, Lisa, and I have been deeply moved by your response to our work, but producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Once again, please go to this jungianlife.com and click on Be Our Patron. Thank you. We thought that instead of doing a dream this time, we would look at a myth, a myth of disconnection from the natural world and see what the archetypal uh, world has to tell us about this. So, Joseph, would you read the myth for us? So there is the myth of Erisikathon that uh, Jeff unpacks beautifully in his book, which is taken from Ovid's Metamorphosis, a collection of Roman mythology. And the myth goes like this. There lived a foolish and arrogant king. His name was Erisikathon. He was as foolish as his daughter was wise. Time and again she'd save him from his own folly, but one morning... Before she understood what was in his mind, he ordered his servants to fetch his subjects from his city. He took them all, his daughter too, down to a grove of trees sacred to the goddess Demeter. Demeter, the crown of corn of the lustrous hair, whom we must thank for every full mouth, for every bulging belly. Demeter, the goddess of plenty, the goddess of the harvest. In the center of the grove there was an ancient oak. Chop it down. His servants looked at one another anxiously. The princess, Father, this is madness. If you cut down the tree, the goddess will punish you for it. Just my point. There are no gods, no goddesses. There's only us. And you are all fools who shake at shadows. I will prove that every prayer is wasted air. He grabbed an axe. He swung it behind him. Everyone who dared to look then saw the tree trembling from its roots to its tips of its leaves. When the blade struck the bark, dark blood came from the wound he'd made, and there was a cry, shrill. I am the spirit who lives in this tree. Cut it down and you slaughter me. If I die by your hand, I swear revenge will fall on you, as heavy as a falling oak. The king, he laughed. He kept on cutting until, with a dreadful moan, the tree crashed to the ground, and the king had his servants fetch his subjects back to his palace. He held a feast that night. He stuffed his mouth, he stuffed his belly, he stuffed his mouth until his belly bulged. That night, nymphs in the grove wept around the tree stump. Then one of them flew up to Mount Olympus, the home of the immortals. She flew to the palace of Demeter, and she asked for revenge. Demeter granted her request. For every power there must be its opposite. If there is a goddess of plenty somewhere, there must be a goddess of lack. Of course, the two can never meet. Demeter said, Nymph, take my dragon-drawn chariot. Ride three days and nights through the sky to the north, till you see below you a leafless, lifeless place. There you will see her, the spirit of hunger. Tell her to possess Erisikathon. Tell her King Erisikathon belongs to her now. The nymph rode the chariot through the sky till she saw below her a wasteland where even the air moaned. She saw hunger at once. 
Hunger was on her hands and knees, scraping at the cracked arid earth, uncovering a tree root that she ground between her teeth. Hunger's face is a blue-gray skull, her jaws clacked together as if she is a cat staring at a bird out of reach. Her joints seemed swollen beside her spindly limbs. Her skin is so thin, veins, guts can be seen quivering within. The nymph knew danger when she saw it. She shouted her instructions from a safe distance away. She shook the reins of the chariot, rose up into the sky. But even so, she felt a cramp in her gut. That night, hunger flew through the sky. She traveled to the palace of King Erisichthon. She crept through an open window. He was fast asleep in his bed on his back, snoring, his mouth open. She pressed her thin lips to his and blew a torrent of starvation into his mouth. Then she was gone, like smoke sucked up a chimney, away from the land of plenty, back to the realm of lack. The king, as he slept, dreamt that he sat at a table eating a meal that tasted of nothing. Next morning he was woken by a nagging pain in his belly. He sat up and found his jaws had a life of their own. They clacked together as if he was a cat staring at a bird out of reach. He called for food. He ate and ate, but his hunger was like a fire. The more he fed it, the stronger it became. He called for more food in bigger bowls, heaped higher, but it was no use. It was as if he was throwing crumbs into a chasm. Food enough to feed his family, food enough to feed his palace, food enough to feed his city, food enough to feed his nation, he crammed into his open mouth. He only stopped chewing to call for more food, more food. He ate his way through all his wealth. He sold all his lands, his herds, his properties, until at last all he had left were the clothes he wore and his daughter. He sold her into slavery for the price of one meal. She did not deserve such a fate. As she was led away, she lifted her head to the heavens. Great Demeter, don't punish me for what my father did. Help me now. Demeter answered her request. When the slave owner reached the harbor, he turned to speak to his new slave. She'd gone. And where she had been, an old fisherman was mending his nets. Hey, you! Where did that woman go? She wears her hair long and loose. She was here moments ago. Where is she now? The princess looked at her hands. She didn't recognize them. She'd never seen them before. Gnarled, brown, trembling. She put her hand to her chin. A beard. The goddess had answered her prayer. The goddess had transformed her. She opened her mouth and out came a voice she didn't know. Oh, she fled into the city. If you go at once, I'm sure you'll catch her. The slave owner turned. He ran as fast as he could. The princess took one step, and she was restored to her true shape. She had an idea. She searched the city till she found her father squatting by the side of the road, cramming leaves and twigs into his mouth. Father, she said, I found a way to save you from yourself. That afternoon, King Erisichthon led into the market a mare, a horse with a flowing mane. A soldier bought it. He paid a high price. As he led it away, the reins in his hands behind him sagged, went slack. He turned and looked. The horse had vanished into thin air, but beside the road a young woman, her hair long and loose, was picking flowers. Next day, King Erisichthon sold a bright bird to an old woman in another market in the city. The woman took it home. She left it in her bedroom. After a while, she opened the bedroom door and looked at it. The bird had gone, vanished into thin air. She ran outside, and all she saw was a young woman, her hair long and loose, picking figs. The next day, King Erisichthon sold a ewe to a shepherd. As the shepherd was urging it out of the city, he stumbled, and in the moment it took him to close his eyes and open them again, the sheep vanished. He turned, looked about him, and there beside the road, a young woman, her hair long and loose, was searching for mushrooms. Every day she played this trick. Every day she won money to feed her father's hunger. But it was no use. At last, the moment she dreaded arrived. Erisichthon was cramming food into his mouth one day. In his eagerness to eat, he bit too soon. He bit into his finger, and it tasted good. He bit it off, and then the next finger, and then the next, and then the next, and then the thumb. 
He chewed, he swallowed. He chewed through his knuckles, through his palm, through his wrist. King Erisikathon devoured himself. Well, thank you, Joseph. That's a beautiful reading of that powerful myth. I just thought I'd make a historical comment on where this myth came from. It actually developed after the Greeks had deforested uh, their land to build a, a huge armada of ships. They wanted to have the largest armada in the Mediterranean. And after deforesting, uh, cutting down the trees, when the rains came, the topsoil washed out into the Mediterranean and their agriculture collapsed. So this myth in a beautiful metaphoric way captures the the implications of our consuming earth, consuming uh, nature. And there are a lot of other really important elements in this, in this um, motifs in this myth around the feminine, uh, the sacred, uh, the dismissal, the, the beginning of the story where Erisikathon's clearly man who doesn't honor the sacredness of the world. He says there are no gods and no goddesses. I mean, it seems to me that this myth really speaks to what you were lifting up before, Jeff, about uh, this, the myth of infinite growth. You know, Erisikathon believed in that myth, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And we're still believing in that myth, that the more we can uh, own, the more we can consume, uh, the more satisfied we are. It's very infantile sort of uh, perception of how to live in the world. He also refuses to believe that the natural world is ensouled. That's right. There's a wonderful image that the, the tree is bleeding, that it has a life of its own. And certainly, if we had any sense that the natural world or outer objects were in some way ensouled, even just psychologically ensouled, it might give us pause. It might give us a moment to wonder, What might the impact be for me to destroy something without at least tending to what that's going to do inside? So there's a valuing here, the not seeing the inherent intrinsic value of the tree, its sacredness, uh, turning away from the the sacredness of of the material world uh, in nature, uh, a disconnection from that. All of those place us in a psychic state where we can cut down the sacred tree. When you're that disconnected from uh, the inherent or intrinsic value of something and the fact that it's disinspirited, then you can perform these heinous acts towards nature. You can deforest, you can dig up fuels and burn them and disrupt global and local environments. You can go drive species into extinction. And then sacred trees are turned into natural resources or or units of something. Right. Which are then yeah. be devoured. There's a variant of the story where the reason he's going out to cut the, the tree down is he, he wants to build the biggest house in town to impress everybody. So there's that hubris and that materialism that, you know, is infused this man. You know, the other thing that came to me when you were reading the story is a, 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 a possession. This is a person who has been possessed to, uh, by the breath of famine or lack uh, to consume. And so psychologically, how or what is possessing us individually and collectively? Who, what or who is possessing us to be so destructive towards the world? Yeah, I thought that was one of the interesting things that really jumped out at me about this myth is the role of hunger. And and she's drawn so vividly in this story. She's so kind of fearsome. But that that's a good point, that he has been possessed by hunger. And in what way are we possessed by hunger as we aim to consume more and more? And what are we hungry for? Mm-hmm. You know, hunger arises from emptiness, right? We, we feel empty within ourselves, inside of ourselves, and we eat to f- fulfill ourselves. Uh, I think that's the central element to this myth, as well as a number of other myths, is if we are empty inside, we are going to look outside for some way to feel fulfilled. 
and that's the root for, of materialism. It's it's the root of consumerism. That somehow, but the, if we owned more, bought more, uh, especially new things, we are going to feel uh, fulfilled, and it never works. We're always hungry, and I think this is where Jungian psychology comes along and says, well, you know. There is this thing called the self. There's an archetype of wholeness. You know, if you're not connected to the archetype of wholeness, then you're going to feel empty. And you're going to look around for all sorts of things to make yourself feel whole, uh, feel, feel fulfilled. Uh, and it just doesn't work. And yet we keep believing that it will work. I was thinking about that same paradigm, the way it plays out in addiction and how 12-step programs are a response this idea of an addiction as a hunger that you want and want and want it till it destroys you. And the restorative function of the 12-step programs is to rediscover the transcendental and to forge a relationship upward. And that that relationship, as well as being part of a community, salves or perhaps drives away the curse of hunger and, and offers something in its place that is sustaining. So one solution, if we take this full circle to what's going on with the environment and the environment being reduced to kind of a unit of raw resource that can be gobbled up, is what's required to restore a relationship to the self. Mm -hmm. And one of the things which we are sorely challenged by is that external religious organizations are no guarantee of a restoration of relationship to the self. Because we see many of these political religious entities even driving this endless hunger for objects and materials and money and, and not necessarily offering true practices by which the individual or the community can truly connect upwards. And the sign of that connection is satiety. Well, this is what Jung talked about in terms of the religious function. He felt that we have an instinct within us. It is the religious function. And its purpose is uh, to connect to the archetype of wholeness within us. And that, that outer religions, many times uh, in the modern age, are not serving that purpose, are not giving us a connection to the religious function, serving the religious function. So I think that's, you know, that's where we need to tend to. You know, that's where we're being pointed to. This myth is actually directing us to that point. Here is a man who does not recognize the reality of the gods and goddesses. Uh, immediately we know he, he, his religious function has, is not being served. You know, I'm paying attention to a real uh, area of specificity in this myth, that it's a goddess. Mm-hmm. It's Demeter. She is the goddess of plenty, of the harvest, uh, the full mouth, and a sense of gratitude, but it's a relationship to some kind of more growthful feminine principle as part of the religious function of the psyche that seems to be called for here. But there's a way that the feminine is related to in the story. It's betrayed, right? Because the daughter is gifted this ability to transform herself in order to save herself. But because she is in service to her father's insatiability, she takes that gift and puts it in service to this project of consuming more and more and more. Right, she monetizes the gift from Demeter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, or to go back to Joseph's analogy with addiction, this is a daughter who's enabling her father's. Mm -hmm. addiction. Yes, you yeah. know, and we see that in family dynamics: a child who will enable the addiction. Yes, and I'm I'm thinking even uh, slightly differently that this is a little bit like uh, McGilchrist's book, The Master and His Emissary, and the daughter is the master, the feminine principle that which is related to the archetype of wholeness. And the king, I think, is uh, the emissary, and the, the master has been betrayed. She is now in service to him instead of the other way around. But to flip this, you have to think of, look at the con her consciousness. 
she is in service to promoting this behavior, which is completely destructive. So there's a development that she needs to go through her own individuation to reach the point where she can say, I'm not going to do this. You know, I'm not going to serve you and, and basically allow you to continue this behavior, uh, to be invested in this belief system. So there's a development that's lacking in her, you know, that, that that's not there yet. So my, the thing of my fantasy goes to what's her relationship to Demeter? What is the daughter's relationship to, to the goddess? Well, she, she, like a lot of people, so to speak, who are caught in untenable situations where rapacious power has owned them, they call forth the trickster. So she becomes a shape-shifting trickster, not unlike Loki or the costumes of Mercury. She can't escape the power of the father, the power of the kind of corporate hunger in a nation. So then she has to become sly in order to survive. I'm still going back to uh, Demeter as an image of archetypal uh, generativity. And abundance. She's the archetype of abundance. Yeah. Oh, she, she, you know, uh, in Latin, it's uh, Ceres and, mm-hmm. and grain and corn of the growing principle. And what does it take for us to be in relationship to that uh, in nature, out in the world, ecologically, but also internally of where is our inner sense of I have enough? This is enough. Uh, And I'm not thinking even just of ourselves as consumers of, okay, I won't buy that extra thing. But I'm thinking of some sense of interiority that the king obviously lacked. He could not be satiated. Where, Where do we find that sense of relationship and enoughness? Well, I'm, uh, what is the archetype or God of limit? <laughs> Saturn. Mm-hmm. Saturn, right. So <clears throat> where is Saturn in, in, in us, in our collective? You know, we have a, one particular view of Saturn, limited, I would say a limited view of Saturn. That mm-hmm. It's very pejorative, but there's a there's an aspect of Saturn that's very positive, which is, you know, your limits. And concrete manifestations of anything require limits. We know that in a laboratory, we know that psychology, psychologically, there has to be a really sealed container for certain things to move out of an idea and into the manifest world. Mm-hmm. In, in the myth, there's also this interesting theme that is being pointed to where the king's daughter is also has a parallel relationship to Persephone, that she is the daughter who's kind of sold to serve the father, the rapacious father. She disappears and then she returns and often returns as Persephone is described as picking flowers in a meadow. So Persephone as the daughter of Demeter being bargained for the rapacious appetites of Zeus. But in this tale, Finally, the rapacious father achieves the moment that she dreaded, so she has a sense of where this is going, and instead of the father being saved, he is actually allowed to be consumed. And if we remember, Zeus was in fact consumed when he was born, right? Right. Kronos ate all of his children. So there's this, (laughs) there's wonderful layers of other myths that are kind of thrumming through this. But there's a sense of instead of constantly working to restore the old king, the corrupt king, the corrupt principle, finally, the corrupt principle is allowed to die. We don't know what else, what's going to emerge in this kingdom next that hopefully would be better, but people have to stop saving and propping up the old attitude that in fact is hurting them. And hurting everyone else. That would be like subsidies for the fossil fuel industry. Right. That's keeping the old myth, the old king in power. Or loaning money to people to take ventures on that are going to be destructive, knowing that they can't ever pay it back, and then uh, damaging the uh, financial industry. There's all kinds of implications of interfering with the old attitude 
the old version of the patriarchy, keeping it propped up. Which is, again, invested in this myth of growth, uh, infinite resources, limitless things to consume. Uh, all of those components are a part of this story, and they're living out through us today. Well, it's a great, a great story, and I really appreciate you bringing it to our attention. And it has been just an incredible, incredible pleasure to have this depthful conversation with you around this important issue, Jeff. So we want to thank you. Well, I deeply appreciate all of you, your, your uh, friendship and your invitation to be a part of this, uh, your wonderful activity. I mean, you are carrying this message out to the world through your podcasts, and I think that's a tremendous service to Psyche. So thank you. And you are carrying a message out across the world and to Psyche. And I think there are many people around the world who are participating in that. And we'll, we, it will make a difference. It, it will make a difference, indeed. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living This Jungian Life.